Okay, so it's just a few days before an important watch auction uh, for Christie's and uh, as you can see, it's still uh, getting prepared. So there's a little bit of noise around, but we're going to meet uh, John Reardon, watch auctioneer, who's going to talk us through the, some of his main lots that are going to be presented here in Geneva. Uh, first, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be back with the Watches TV. and. I just arrived just off the plane from New York and to be back in Geneva is always exciting because this is the World Cup of watches over the next few days and, and of course we have only watch and, and then we have our, uh, our various owner sale uh, right afterwards. But in the next few minutes I'd love to show you some of my personal favorites and uh, starting with a pocket watch. Now when you look at a piece like this from 1883 it's a lot of fun to to imagine the amount of quality you can buy at a price point that is um, comparable to a modern piece, very, very reasonable. This is estimated at 25 to 35,000 Swiss francs, and what you're buying is the best of 19th century technology, and it's made by hand. These pieces had the finest dial makers, case makers, and the way that the movements uh, were made is uh, unmatched, and a lot of the secrets of Swiss watchmaking have been lost um, uh, to this era. When you engage the minute repeater of this watch, it's so crisp, and what you're listening to is exactly the, the, the sound, the tone, the pitch of the gentleman who owned this first in the 1880s. Now this particular person who owned it was uh, a diplomat um, that was stationed in Nice, France from uh, Portugal. And uh, this watch is accompanied by the original box, the original papers, even its original timing certificate. And you can see his initials uh, in monogram here on the case. Now moving on from the, the 19th century, let's uh, fast forward to the early 1960s. In 1959, there was a gentleman named Gilbert Albert. Now many of us know his name, he's a, a celebrated uh, god of wristwatch design and he did works for not only Patek Philippe also Rolex and Omega and he's really known for being one of the first watch case designers and bracelet designers that embraced a very organic form of design. He loved to have things that are kind of as found in nature with the, the engraving, using the jewels to almost have like a maritime feel. This is, almost looks like barnacles that would, on, on a lady's wristwatch. It's, it's almost something you could find on the beach. Well, I wish. It has that, uh, that, that beautiful aesthetic with the, the sapphires, the, the diamonds and, and the emeralds. And it opens to reveal. And forgive my wrist, it's not the right way to present this watch. But you, it opens to reveal the, the Patek Philippe dial. And this was made um, in 1961 for an important uh, exhibition in Geneva um, where he won uh, numerous awards. And Gilbert Albert went on to an incredible career with many accolades afterwards. And to see these fresh to market pieces come back with the original uh, ring, and uh, this actually has its earrings too, is, is something that's, that's quite fun. And, uh, and the price point um, for this, these are, um, let me give the exact amount of money, ah, 50, 50 to 80,000 um, Swiss francs uh, to have a, a unique piece from Patek Philippe from the mid 20th century. I was going to say, I mean, this is obviously very rare to come on the market, right? Yes, I, I think every, every year we might see one credible Gilbert piece, uh, Gilbert Beer piece surface. Often we see um, the pocket watches, um, which are um, they're called from the Ricochet collection which are beautiful. They look like the kind of stones you'd skip across the water uh, at a pond, and they're, they're ultra thin and completely engraved by hand uh, by uh, uh, Master uh, Gilbert Albert. And uh, they're, they're treasures from the past, um, treasures for the, the future too. Moving forward to, actually we're gonna move back in 10 years in time, because I neglected to show you this exceptional 565 in stainless steel with Breguet numerals. Now, this is the kind of watch that, to have on the wrist, I mean, I don't even want to put it next to my 3445, to, to see a 565, not only the case design or the water resistant, the, the dials, when they're um, beautifully aged, and this has its uh, original loom still present on the hands, is something that's uh, really to be, uh, to be seen and appreciated in person. Uh, 565s have gone up price considerably in, in recent years as, as many steel incredible condition timepieces have but this particular Patek Philippe is, uh, is also a favorite reference of mine 
the, uh, the size on the wrist, the aesthetic, uh, the functionality. Uh, a 565 is something that belongs in every, every collection. And a steel version like this, that's also pretty rare? Yeah, so in stainless steel, they, um, they're the least common. Um, we see them often in uh, yellow gold is the most common, still beautiful watches, also in rose. Um, but to have one in stainless steel with Brigade numerals, and then that is emphasized, confirmed on the archive, makes all the difference in price point. And at 40 to 60,000 Swiss francs, I'm going, willing to bet that's going to be a conservative price point based on what it brings at the end of the day. So, should we jump forward to the, the ultimate watch, in my opinion? Uh, in, in my uh, career, obsessing with Patek Philippe over the last 20 years, I have to admit, this is one of my favorites um, because it's a watch full of mystery. It's full of surprises. It's, it's uh, unexpected um, recent developments, and I'd like to, to share that story with you now. So the last time that we saw this particular white gold Sanza Luna show up at auction was at Antiquorum in 2004, and it brought approximately 680,000 Swiss francs. So when, uh, when my colleague uh, Sabine, the head of department in New York, uh, rediscovered this watch for the collector that had it for 13 years. Uh, we knew it was a Sanza Luna. We know the story of the Sanza Lunas. Um, we were excited about it. Um, but we wanted to dig deeper. We wanted to learn more. And we really wanted to unravel uh, the mystery behind uh, the Sanza Lunas. So this is what was known in the past. Seven have, uh, to date, publicly surfaced. Of these seven watches, um, well, before, there was only one that was everyone was absolutely sure about, and that was the, the famous Allen Banbury uh, 3448 in yellow gold that uh, Sotheby sold a few, a few years back here in Geneva for 1.7 million Swiss francs. It was confirmed on the archive. It was born and uh, set, the watch was made originally in um, the late 60s, I believe in 1968, and the dial was changed in 1975 to remove the moon phase. Sansa Luna means without moon, and by having that simple change on the dial, it makes the aesthetic of these watches completely different. So, fast forward to 2004, this, this watch surfaces and sells, sells at auction, and then it's rediscovered. So the question is, was this dial born on this watch? As you can see in our cataloging in the cell, we only tell part of the story because we explain how these are most likely prototype dials, how these um, beautiful watches have surfaced but no one really knows the truth theory and how you have to dig in the forensic study of each piece to make your own opinion of whether it's original to the watch or not. After we went to print with that story, sure enough, after waiting weeks, we receive uh, an email with the extract from the archives from Patek Philippe confirming that in 1981, this watch was indeed born with a Sanza Luna dial. Now this changes everything. All of a sudden, it's like, don't even read the catalog, because you have to look at the facts of what we know about this watch. This was originally born with this dial, which makes it more important in a way than, than the, the Allen Banbury watch, which was changed after being born with a moon phase. So we had a master watchmaker remove the dial, and we looked at the mechanism uh, underneath, and sure enough, this never had a moon phase mechanism um, as part of this watch. This changes this watch that's estimated from three to 500,000 Swiss francs to a whole new level. Um, we have collectors already, it's early on, who are just clamoring to get a phone to compete to own one of the most important paddock, we'll call it rediscoveries of, of recent years. Uh, the watch condition on top of the confirmation of the dial is exquisite. The hallmarks are so crisp. The return on the edge of the lug is exactly what we want to see in an unpolished 3448. Also, you can see the, the, the chamfer uh, on each of the lugs is absolutely perfect. The bezel condition, it's everything that you want to see in terms of condition and rarity. So when you put this on the wrist, it has this beautiful monochrome aesthetic, uh, which I think it is one of the most beautiful watches that was made in the, uh, in the 20th century. Um, all told, this is a piece that we expect will be one of the highlights of the season. 
uh, especially in terms of Patek Philippe, and uh, it'll be a good battle. And the person who has the foresight and understanding to uh, acquire this timepiece is going to be very happy uh, having this on their wrist and as, as a, the ultimate trophy in their collection. Literally changing gears to talk about Rolex. Uh, I picked three of my favorites from the sale, and I absolutely love cloisonne enamel dials. And whether Patek Philippe, Vacheron Constantine, Omega, or Rolex, among many other brands, these are works of art. And this particular enamel of a dragon on, on, on yellow is just, is just magical. And it was made by Stern Frere, and Mrs. Nelly Richard was the enamel artist uh, on record who um, handmade this dial. The amount of firings and colors and um, the detail that go into making these cloisonne enamel dials is incredible. And, and my understanding is for every dial that comes out right, they end up disposing of dozens of the, the so-called rejects. But this, this particular piece has uh, everything that you'd want to see uh, in uh, a 1950s cloisonne dial. Um, it has a small crack, uh, full disclosure, between 12 and 2, which will greatly affect the value of this piece. However, it's, it's an honest watch. It's the kind of piece that um, someone could wear, someone could enjoy, and uh, at, the, at the price point, at 120,000 to 180, it is, uh, it's a, a very uh, obtainable price to own one of these miniature works of art. Without the crack, would you th what would you think would be the, the, the other estimate then? I think it would double the price e easily, if even, even more, even more. Um, so if you own a cloisonne dial, take good care of it. It's because uh, you're, you're taking care of something for generations, and this is 70 years old now. And and I, I wonder what the value of these types of watches will be in 10, 20, 30 years. And condition rules the day today, and it'll rule the day in the future. So. Moving forward, um, just a few years, uh, we're going to jump to this beauty. Excuse me. This is something that the Rolex community is absolutely raving about right now. And, and I've had the pleasure to learn quite a bit uh, about this piece because it's, it's a true hybrid. At first look, it's a, it's a sports, it's an explorer dial, but it's combined with a day date. So it begs the question, is it some sort of marriage or what's, what's happening with, with, with this timepiece? Uh, and then we discovered the family who uh, can sign this piece. It's, um, it's from the original family. We have a, a stack of pictures of the person who originally commissioned it, wearing it on his wrist from the day he received it. And then that changes the story, because all of a sudden we know this, is, this was original. And, and sure enough, in uh, this Copenhagen retailer, the gentleman went and custom ordered this piece. And, uh, and we heard there may be one more in existence, um, which we don't know where it is today, with this identical configuration. So um, combined, this is, uh, this is a piece that, uh, forgive the term, there's a unicorn in, in the watch world. It's something that no one would believe. They think it's from the world of fantasy, but this is reality. I'm holding it in my hands. It's documented. And at the estimate of um, 60 to 120,000, I think the market is going to speak very loudly on Monday when this comes up for auction. And that was very rare uh, for Rolex to do uh, special orders like this. So. Absolutely. Um, Rolex is not known for doing custom special order pieces. This isn't like putting a Kanjar on a dial for, for Oman. This is, this is something that's a unique piece. It's a complete conf uh, reconfiguration of regular production models. And it's recently been serviced by Rolex too, and they've, um, uh, they've completely uh, documented the piece. So it's, it's something that's, um, that's unbelievable, but it's, it's true. And it's, it's going to uh, find a good home very shortly. Everybody now is talking about John Player specials, uh, inspired by the, uh, the Formula One race car uh, colors of the, the famous JPS. Um, this particular piece uh, ticks, checks all the boxes, as they say, in terms of uh, condition, design, the aesthetic. Uh, it's 18K, has uh, also accompanied by a 14 karat uh, bracelet. But what's so nice is it has, on the back of it, you can see it has these French import marks. Um, when, when you look really closely under, under a loop, you can see the, the crispness of these marks. Not only does it help tell the history of the watch, document the piece, but also show it hasn't been over-polished to have those, uh, those crisp pieces. Um, this is for the, the collector that wants to have uh, the ultimate uh, sports watch. 
Uh, right now, it's uh, Daytona mania, as, as we all know. And it will be interesting to find out how that will translate uh, into the prices in, in, in the coming days.